So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Keeson Patel, who is an M&A expert and the CEO of The Deal Room. Welcome, Keeson. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, pleasure. Now, I understand that you're over in Denver and you very kindly joined us while you're traveling around the world. So appreciate that. Um, tell us a little bit about your story, Keeson. Give us a little bit of history about, you know, where you've got to and where you came from. Sure. I started my career as an M&A advisor for about a decade, pretty typical founder story and working with that industry, I became familiar with the common pain points and challenges of managing an M&A transaction. From there, I got involved in a tech startup focused in marketing technology that didn't work out the way I wanted it to. But it did expose me to the way software engineers would utilize these project management tools to manage developing software much more efficiently, which led to the inspiration for starting DealRoom as a project management product for managing mergers and acquisitions in 2012. And it was a pretty, to be frank and honest, rough journey, I would say, especially the first five years a lot of hard lessons in learning how to assemble an engineering team that could productively build quality software, how to validate that you're actually building a product that solves the right problem. How do you go to market with that product uh, and and build your marketing and, and sales functions to be able to distribute it efficiently? Uh, when doing this one of the things that we became good at was creating a, a feedback loop to become uh, experts at the customer's problem and developing solutions with this really tight feedback loop. Over time, our product evolved from an original solution for managing the due diligence phase of buying a company to then managing the integration phase, then the pipeline management has really evolved into a full lifecycle management solution end-to-end that we sell to larger corporates, typically a billion plus market cap Mm -hmm. that are doing three or more acquisitions a year. Over time, we also identified very massive underpinning problem in our industry, Deborah, that was that the industry itself was siloed and lacked best practices standardization With that, we took the opportunity of starting a podcast as a platform to enable practitioners to be able to share lessons learned from their experience so that we can, again, take that same feedback approach, identify patterns, identify the proven techniques, which over time we ended up publishing as a framework called Agile M&A that was also anchored by case studies with Google and Atlassian, specifically how they use Agile techniques stemming from the engineering culture and applied it to M&A with great success. And that podcast continued to evolve into a full digital media business where we produce quite a bit of content, host events, run an online academy program and uh, continue to identify and and, uh, launch new business lines. But that's our business today. It's a hybrid of a series of business lines themed around education and technology for M&A. That's fantastic. And I understand you've got a team of 35 now. So you obviously had a, a, a couple of very tough years, like you said, but you're coming coming around now and things are ticking along quite nicely. Is that right? Absolutely. We're a fun growth stage right now. We're yeah. 35 with eight open roles. I, I think we're, we're hiring for. So uh, you get a lot of fun changes with management and new exciting challenges every day. Perfect. Hey, look, I always ask our um, guests to share a personal and a professional best. And I know that we've already talked about this before. So love to hear your personal best and then your professional best, which I think will lead into what we're going to talk about today. I think my, my personal best was a fun. It was from an inspiration of a, a podcast. I did it. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name it was last year, but I got this idea to do more of a at home state of the union. And I did this in the beginning of the year with my family to give a state of the union about our household. What's the, what have been our goals as a family? What have we achieved over the past years? What are we looking forward to in the new year? 
And I also worked with my three kids. They're young. My daughter's 11. I have two boys, six and eight, to help them identify what are their personal goals for the year. So I, I think it was a fun activity where we do it in business, but why, why not take it in, in our household to start framing our goals and reflect on the success that we've had? So I think that was the the personal best for the year, just a, a little fun activity. Perfect. We actually have, um, we use a thing called the VTO, which is the Vision Traction Organizer in EOS. And we actually have a family version of that as well. And my husband and I did the same thing at the beginning of the year. We sat down and said, right, what is actually our family plan? What's our 10-year goal? Um, what are our sort of core values? What are we aiming to achieve this year, next uh, next 90 days? And yeah, it's certainly a fun exercise. Yeah, I'm looking at expanding on it because I, I think you get caught up with so much of the day-to-day of managing a household with young children that you sort of lose sight of some of the, the broader things and the direction of, of the family as a whole. Yeah. Okay. And I understand I'm um, just taking a little bit off track, but I, I, when we spoke before, your daughter is a little budding entrepreneur as well. And so she's been in business since um, she was six. Is that right? I remember six, she came to me and said, daddy, I want to start a lemonade stand. And I, I was a little, uh, uh, bit, a little uh, resistant at first, uh, you know, I said, ah, I don't know about this. And then I, I really, it just dawned on me. I'm like, this is actually an opportunity to teach her a lot of the business fundamentals. I said, all right, honey, I don't know if you've picked the best dad to do this, but we're going to do it. We're not taking any shortcuts. And it was a, it was a we're definitely a fun project for us to go through a whole series of iterations where she built a uh, fairly well-known lemonade stand uh, nearby Wrigley Stadium in Chicago and became quite well-known in the neighborhood and uh, profited well too. Excellent. And she's still running the business today, right? So 11 years old, she's got a different business now though, right? But yeah, she shifted. We had COVID happen and she said, yeah, what am I going to do? I can't run the lemonade stand. I said, well, you got to do everything like everybody else in the world and figure out your digital distribution model. And uh, I think she found her passion with jewelry. She started making handmade jewelry, sold a couple hundred of her classmates. And now she's working on her uh, online web presence. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay, so that's that's personal. What about professional? What's your professional best, do you think? I, for professional, for me, the early years, I, I remember getting to a point where I had about five employees in the company and realized I was struggling with leadership, keeping a team aligned, motivated. And I, I, I didn't know where to go to for help. I think back then there wasn't such a strong ecosystem for startups and, and resources of that sort. Uh, I wasn't well networked. And I remember I started reading leadership books, but it didn't quite resonate with me. And it, it was when I started reading a organizational psychology books that really helped myself get a better understanding of what the ideal workplace should look like. Yeah. And it's three key pillars that I reference today, which is creating a platform of communication where every person in the organization can feel their voices heard. And today we have examples of the most junior developer speaking up about ideas for our product that led to be one of the leading product features uh, to even any person on the admin team pointing out cracks emerging in the company so we can solve them before they blow through the floor uh, to be able to secondly create a acknowledgement for achievements because everybody wants to feel valued that their work and what they're contributing Two is creating value for a greater good and being able to do that on a monthly basis where we take time to acknowledge achievements across the different departments and functions in our company. And uh, I think third is creating an environment where you feel you work amongst friends. You can build a good relationship that allows you to be comfortable, vulnerable, allows you to speak up and ask for help when you need it. And so we try to keep uh, some of these even now more of a online experience with a little personal touch so we can spend time to talk about some of the things outside the, the daily business, but also do flying events, things where we can spend time to really get to know each other and build those bonds. Mm. So I, those are the things that I've learned professionally that we strive for to create a positive work environment that allows us to set a stage for progress. Okay. I mean, they're, they're absolute fundamentals. I get it. I mean, um, especially in this sort of online environment is making sure you have a really not only smart but healthy team that is prepared to have those discussions, prepared to, to work together for the greater good is really important. 
Have you ever had a, a point where you've kind of hit the ceiling and really felt like you were just stuck and couldn't get past there? You know, that's my biggest fear. It's probably the biggest thing I, I, I fear of. I've had that in prior businesses. This wasn't the first venture I've done. Yep. And that, that's always been the biggest fear is that we fall flat because after falling flat comes decline. Mm. And decline leads to cease. <laughs> yes. And a lot of stress along the way as well. <laughs> yeah. And so that, that was the thing. I've, it's always been the concern is that he, he flatlining. Uh, so there, we always have proactive measures to assure that it doesn't happen. And since starting this business well, 10 years ago, every time towards the end of the year, things slow down for us, less and less so every year. And we take that time to retool, rebuild our business, reimagining rebuilding our business and looking at it with some external eyes, looking at it from the customer's eyes and thinking through how can we revamp this business? How can we remodel our organization to be prepared for growth going into the next year? Mm -hmm. And it's a lot. You know, every year we review the whole business model. We review our pricing strategy. We review the markets we're going after. Uh, we review our marketing. You know, all these things are full go-to-market gets completely revamped and just looked at with a fresh pair of eyes and we retool it. Uh, we do that every year and we might not be able to get to all of it every year, but we do a good amount of that rethinking, retooling, remodeling approach that allows us to go into this new year with a lot of initiatives uh, with the full intention of bringing change to the organization for greater good. So I, I think that's one of the things that we just built into the company that every year we're going to have to retool and really hit this market with something completely different. Yeah. Okay. And that's great. A great way to approach businesses reviewing it every year. What do you do along the way to make sure that you're, you know, sticking to that plan that you're making changes as needed? How do you, and you, you talked about, you know, the acknowledgement of achievements and success. And so how do you know when you've achieved that success? Yeah, that, that's actually evolved quite a bit. I think early years, it's very much about product roadmap, what are we building? Are we getting the functionality that we want out there? Uh, are we getting some initial traction with users? So we might have basic goals. I think as the business has evolved, now we're utilizing OKRs that um, define what are the goals in the broader organization and how each in the department rolls up into the broader organization goal and how each individual's goals can roll up to their department goals. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think there is a lot more definition around what are these individual goals for every contributor uh, that's going to roll up to what the broader goals is for the organization, which is very much focused on growth that we want to benchmark and continue. I, I always like to build a two X, you know, we want to double in size every year. Uh, so we really need to be proactive about that. And that's where it's important for us to look at, the big picture and then come back and really figure out what do we need to achieve incrementally across the different teams and individuals to be able to achieve that target. And we talked about this before we came onto the podcast, you know, that sort of being really clear about what you are building and what that future looks like. It's something that a lot of businesses that I work with have probably got somewhere in the back of their mind, but they haven't taken the time to really define it and articulate it. And once they get there and they do that, it, everything else can then start to fall in place because you've got that. So how do you, what do you do with your team around that bigger picture, that longer term goal? And where does it come from? Yeah, that's a big thing. It's like the thing you constantly have to articulate is mm -hmm. this sort of where are we going to go defining the reason why, you know, that's this, this always got to have a great purpose or reason why I think we, we forget that sometimes yeah. we sort of get a little too tactical about it, but people need meaning. You know, when, when we, one of the toughest things about our job as a company isn't so much driving the internal change. I think we've established a 
change oriented culture in our company uh, that that's really shaped and settled and it's it's a big part of our culture mm-hmm. i think it's working with our clients because you have a varying degree of adaptiveness from these customers that we work with and that's when it really tests our skills because if you're looking to drive change for a company that's been very stagnant in change over the past decades now you're faced with a very difficult challenge and that's a part of our core ability to create value is to initiate change. Mm. That's where we really have to do some work and, and dig into being able to do that. Uh, and it always starts with a deep understanding. Can we spend the time to understand this organization? What does their process look like in our context of mergers and acquisitions? What does that workflow look like when they go through the process of buying a company? Who are those stakeholders involved? Can we open up conversations, qualitative interviews to understand each stakeholder's pain points and challenges that they encounter from their perspective. Uh, I think one client I worked with that was a Fortune 500 manufacturer, one of the, I guess, pivotal chain to realization on what it really takes to drive change was going through this and trying to put the over effort to really make sure this was successful because it was one of the first big opportunities we had. And I went through these series of interviews to understand as much as I could about their process and where the problems were. And a part of this was not knowing better or just trying to get the dialogue within the teams or across the teams, since it seemed that there wasn't a clear linkage between the problems in this stage and the problem in this stage. Uh, so with that, we got these seven stakeholders all to pile in a conference room And I said, hey, the only activity I want to do today is prioritize what the problems we're looking to solve for your team. Uh, I have a list of things that I've gathered from conversations with most of the folks here in this room. And I'm going to mention, it doesn't matter who said what, that part's irrelevant. I just want to go through and prioritize this just to know that we're spending our time, which is a pretty rational thing to do. We're going to spend money, resources, Let's make sure we're solving the most important thing for the organization. Is that a fair answer request? And uh, so they agreed and, and we went through, but that exercise just could feel how much value it created. Some of the things that we talked through gave a lot of transparency. It created a lot of uh, understanding and even empathy for across these team members to really identify what issues and where they're stemming from and getting more of that clarity. Mm -hmm. And some of this stuff that led to very obvious changes that could be made with very minimal effort. And it became clear and the clear on why make that change that it was easy to get that across and make that commitment right there on the spot. And then once you got this exercise completed, it lended to a very obvious roadmap on what we could do to make some immediate changes that would add an immense amount of value. And then allowed me to really understand what areas that we could focus on and identify other areas, whether it be practice oriented or technology oriented to allow uh, solutions to be applied and continue adding value to overcome these challenges. So I, I think there's, a great deal of effort when it comes to driving that change, when you're working with a team that isn't used to it. And it's very, very driven off of communication, but much so listening first and taking this mindset that you can put aside your agenda of whatever products you want to sell or whatever ideas you want to push and pitch uh, your subject matter expertise and level down to this mindset that, you know nothing or whatever you do know is wrong and intently listen with a full focus and objective of understanding the other person's thinking, how they feel, why they feel that way, understanding their goals, their challenges, allowing you to embrace how you could be a better aligned to help them achieve those goals and challenges. And that's what ultimately led to a lot of, the ability to drive change by clarifying what the compelling reason is to change across this organization. 
And so is that same principle applied inside your organization as well? Because that's um, a very good way to look at things is, you know, what are the issues, the opportunities, get them all out on the table, have the open discussions, prioritize them, make sure that you're dealing with them in the right order. Is that the way you run inside the business as well? You can, absolutely. You can't be a hypocrite. Yeah. So there's sometimes you got to remind yourself that, hey, we, we preach and we talk about our values and things, but we have to uh, assure, ensure that we're living by those, those same values. So it's important to even keep that a very surface conversation internally. Yep. I, I think it gets a little easier to keep that aligned when it's part of the culture. And when you see it slipping in different areas, you got to be proactive about reminding your team members of these values. I think the area that we're moving into is we've, we've been very clear about it in the recent years, which has enabled us to do better hiring mm. because now we look for specific values. I think it's um, the stage we're at now is how do you regulate your team on those values that they can identify when team members are not living by those values? How do we sort of create a acknowledgement for those that are doing it well and uh, acknowledgement for those that aren't doing it well? Uh, and, and so I, I think that's um, kind of where, where we're moving towards now is, is sort of how, how do you get the team to self-regulate it so it's not you know a top-down responsibility? Absolutely. And so um, do you mind sharing with me the values in your organization or just give me sort of a sense of you know what they are and how you – help to keep those alive in the organization? Yeah, it was, we have broader values for the company. We have leadership values. The broader values are uh, responsiveness, yep. empathetic listening, uh, change-oriented, attention to detail, and resilience. Oh, nice. yep. And then yep. for the leadership values, it's discipline, learning pattern, and empathy. And then we expand on those because obviously those words are broad and could have unique meanings to each organization sure and ha and so the, yeah that's great that you, you know you, you obviously um you know them you're, you're living by them how do you make sure the team is actually living by them and what do you do two questions here so how do you ensure the team is living by them and what do you do when there's somebody who perhaps isn't the right fit talking about it we talk about it we put it in our job posts and in our interviews and internally we'll re bring them up even when we have meetings just to remind everybody, these are core things. Or then we do get those points when you see it lacking in specific areas. Uh, I had a, a sales rep that was late to respond to one of the relationships I had that I sent over to him. And I said, look, you know, this is our first value is responsiveness. Mm. You know, if, if we're not going to take ownership of this, we can get together and talk about it. And maybe we've got to reevaluate what our values are. That's, you know, that's something we, we figure if we're not going to do that, then we need to change it because we put this publicly on our website and if we're not going to own it and, and live by it internally, that's a problem. Uh, and then you sort of get this realization like, oh no, you're, you are right. I, I'm going to change that behavior and get that commitment on it. Um, so I, I think that's one thing we're learning now is sort of how do you get the team to even self-regulate around that, which I, I think um, it, it's kind of the part of evolving your, your organization because you can't always... You got to let go of a lot of the top down, especially when you reach around 20 to 30 yeah. team members, you start standing up function. You really depend more on the leadership of each functional group. Absolutely. So have you ever had um, a real challenge in, in growing the organization? What would be the biggest challenge you've had? I, there's always been a challenge okay. in every stage. Yeah. I, yeah. Early stage was just getting the right engineering team together. Once you got a right engineering team together, uh, we built the wrong product. And I, I think the thing that a lot of entrepreneurs skip is validating the problem you're solving. Mm -hmm. If you can go through a series of discovery interviews to articulate the problem first, because the more better understanding you have of the problem, the better solution you can develop. Yep. We tend to skip that because we have our idea, we're excited, we wanna go build a product, we got you know, our idea in the mind a lot of assumptions when we'll build it, uh, then you find out the hard way that the customer has a very different view. And if you were to spend the time to understand how do they look at their problem, how do they envision what a solution would look like? Uh, and just at least have that feedback. You know, there are a few, you know, wonders of Steve Jobs type of entrepreneurs out there 
but in the reality, most aren't. Most should keep a tight feedback loop, really understand the problem, do maybe 40 of these interviews to look for patterns. You may stumble across a bigger problem that's actually worth solving. You may find out your problem wasn't worth solving. You may twist it a little bit and understand it in a way that allows you to think of a different solution than you originally had in mind. Uh, and then you, you bring this network of people you're developing in a journey with you as you iterate and start evolving and, and developing solutions. That was a big pain point and challenge. And as you create the solution, having it in that early mock-up stage makes it a lot easier to make modifications and changes. When you build a product, it's a lot harder. Learning how to do that, make these iterations when it's a mock-up stage was another thing we learned in product development. Then came go to market which we didn't validate our go-to-market. We copied what the incumbents were doing, which was a huge costly mistake for us. Mm. It didn't let, allow us to get the results we wanted. And we wasted a lot of time, money, and, and resources. Um, it wasn't until we took time to take that same approach, talk to the customers, understand how do they I'll learn about products. Where were the channels that we could access to them? Mm -hmm. And we found that our corporate clients we were targeting are hungry for knowledge. They're interested in evolving their practice and getting better at what they do. Though so in turn, we should provide them these resources that this industry lacked the resources they need to do, equip them to do really well. That problem I mentioned prior of the silos and lack of standardization, yep. we were able to fill that gap by doing a series of interviews of subject matter experts, extracting what are some of these key takeaways, lessons, and techniques, being able to provide that as a resource allowed us to build trust, build our brand, get recognized as subject matter experts. Uh, and then that allowed us to start fostering those relationships by providing value upfront for free that in turn turned us our business into this inbound uh, business model, which is very unique in our industry. Most other competitors are doing purely outbound. They have a lot of overhead. They have to pay field reps. They give them expense cards, travel expenses, et cetera. And now we've been able to uh, challenge that model with this inbound inside sales model that was as effective or if not more effective as we've sold into multinational companies. Um, and then things evolve. You know, Now we're starting to build uh, the outbound function, but at that time and stage, that wasn't the right approach for us. Yep. Now that we're great, gaining momentum, have validation with some very uh, recognized logos, you now we can start changing our go-to-market. Uh, so that's another challenge that over time, we had to change our whole go-to-market because you can only count on these inbound leads to a certain level. Our focus shifted from the smaller SMBs to large enterprise. Uh, and then when you change your focus to large enterprise, your your whole go-to-market motion needs to change as well. Yep. So there, there's always been a series of challenges. And even now, keeping up with our hiring needs. Yep. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we have eight open roles for a team of 35. It gets challenging for each of my functional letter, leaders to take ownership of hiring. That now we need to develop a central HR function to support hiring across the functions. Um, so that it's the current challenge that never ends. So it's, it's always, you look at it as an exciting opportunity for yourself as a leader to learn yep. and keep growing. Uh, it's interesting. I actually worked, I don't know if you're aware of him, but Dr. Rob Adams, um, who is a market validation expert over in the US. I actually worked with him and trained under him. And he was saying that, you know, market validation is an ongoing thing. Sure, you need it right at the beginning, but it's a, but something you should be doing all the time. And, and you've just articulated it beautifully, almost as if you were reading from his book in terms of we don't spend enough time actually understanding what people really want and testing whether our ideas are great. Because, you know, by having those conversations with customers, you uncover things you perhaps need never thought of or you realize that what you thought they were prepared to pay for they actually aren't so yeah that's great to hear um you're putting that stuff in, into practice hey um we're coming to the end of the podcast it goes so quickly it's almost our sort of our, our time but i always want to share sort of three things that people can actually take away with them so three top tips or tools or books or things that change your world what would you share with the listeners I was, you know, I was, it's right when you say that, I think of values and the, the values I mentioned earlier around leadership, where it's discipline, learning pattern, and empathy. I think having that well-defined 
and also allowing that to guide you in how you want to develop yourself professionally Mm -hmm. is the one thing I, I would really leave that extends into three different things because you want to build this into a pattern where I have it as a calendar reminder every morning that these are the specific skills I'm working on to overcome. To have a lot of people to know this, I used to mumble all the time. And oh, really? colleagues I've worked with will remember that, that when I had new people, they hard, had trouble understanding me because I mumbled and that was something I had to overcome. And I had to have a reminder. I took voice lessons, even taking an alphabet uh, tutorial on YouTube to pronounce each letter clearly. It, 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 I had to challenge myself, but it was something where I, I kept that in that morning reminder to remind myself from the very beginning, what are these areas that I'm working on? When I think of that, I think of that value of discipline. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key things is you got to build that in yourself as a objective pattern from the very beginning of the day, that it's time to play the game, that it's a skill to get comfortable doing the things that you're otherwise uncomfortable doing. And it's something you need to push yourself as this internal muscle that you can flex to get out of body and do those things you're uncomfortable doing until you get comfortable doing them. And that's something that you just have to be consciously conscious about from the beginning as your ritual to be disciplined and get better at being disciplined. Uh, we talk about a learning pattern is, is one I'm, I've been talking to my daughter a lot about recently that as you evolve professionally, you also have to exercise that ability to learn that you actually need to get more efficient about learning Because when you grow a business, you constantly need to learn about different things, different areas. We talked about these different challenges. I need to learn how to overcome the series of challenges. And a lot of times we get comfortable in a certain pattern of learning where we may be used to channels like our blog posts that we follow, Wikipedia articles. We don't have a strong habit of reading books. Mm -hmm. Well, reading books is a good challenge in a lot of ways because it requires a lot of focus. It can help the... uh, uh, a form of meditation and, and, and exercise your, your concentration capabilities, but you're learning from a different format where a lot of times people condense a whole lifetime experience into a book. So being able to expand on that and saying, Hey, now I'm going to include specific books as part of my learning pattern. And now what I'm working with my daughter uh, Shyla on is subject matter experts wow. that you're building this business and you can learn from these online resources, but you need to be able to create a network of professionals in your industry and field where you can leverage and learn from their experience and leverage that network as you come across challenges and be able to have that peer group uh, or mentorship group that you can rely on for the advice, the guidance, the ideas that will allow you to navigate those challenges and make better decisions. Uh, So that's like a really important, that's why I'm a big advocate of podcasting that often gives you access to people that you would otherwise be able to have access to in a way that's cordial because you're helping them out by getting their messages out there, but you're also developing yourself and your communication skills at the same time. So it's, it's really helpful learning pattern. And then the third one, I, I, I would say is empathy. We talked mm-hmm. a little bit about earlier when you can really push away your own agenda and get into this absolute focus on the other person to align yourself around their goals and objectives it really builds this in-depth relationship with others that allows them to feel that they're being felt and that your intentions are there. Uh, and they, they tend to reciprocate when somebody's helping them, they naturally want to want to help back most of the time. Not always. And if they're not, they're more self-serving than you can move on and, and find yeah. somebody else that is uh, uh, more of a better nature. <laughs> So I think those are the times you always think of those values as what's the key three in terms of some books, you know, with the empathy, just listen was one of my favorite books written by Mark Golston. I I remember struggling reading with all these leadership books and I I came across Mark's book, just listen. And it it taught me so much about empathy that really helped myself develop much richer, uh, richer professional and, and personal relationships. So that's when I always encourage when I'm meeting new entrepreneurs or, or speaking with undergrad students. Uh, you know, I, I like uh, when we think about learning pattern and a good example of a book with a lot of concentration of knowledge is a book called Just Listen that I believe was uh, uh, put together with uh, Peter Bravin that um, 
is a compilation of great world thinkers. I think they they listed as uh, Darwinism to Munger. And um, I like the theme of the book. They sort of walk you through the evolution of the human brain into why humans make misjudgment based on 20 some biases that we encounter so that you can be conscious about it and walks you through ways to make better decisions. Uh, it's a good bedside book because each chapter gives you a lot to think about. Yeah, but those are a couple of favorite books. Well, that's fantastic. Hey, look, thank you. Um, you have been very, very generous in terms of sharing and helping out our listeners. I'd just like to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart for that. I really appreciate it. It's all about for me. It's all about helping others to actually learn from other people and to to live a better life. That's what my ultimate passion is: getting people living a better life through creating a better business. So, really appreciate your time. If somebody wants to get in contact with you or find out more about you or about the business, what's the best place they can go to to do that? Sure. If anybody's interested in mergers and acquisitions, we have tons of free resources. Uh, it's available at mascience.com. Myself, I am on LinkedIn, Kisan, K-I-S-O-N, Patel. Wonderful. Hey, Kisan, honestly, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I look forward to following your journey and good luck with getting those eight new people and continuing to grow it two times every year. I'm sure you'll be there. Yeah. Myself, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Deborah. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.